So let's come to our Bible reading now. I'm reading from John chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognise him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you've put him and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni! which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father. But go and find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. And then she gave them his message. Let's pray. Risen Jesus, you appeared to different people at different times and in different places. And for each of them, it was a personal encounter, which spoke to them personally of your resurrection life and power. It was only when they met you face to face, like Mary did, that the truth dawned and they dared to believe that you were alive and all your promises are true. So as we come this Easter morning, Will you meet with us now, a personal encounter with our risen Lord, so that we can see and believe the reality that you are alive and that your resurrection power is loose in the world and cannot be contained. In the midst of isolation, sickness and death in our country and our world, this is your resurrection day and we are seeking the reality of new life in you today. Holy Spirit, open our hearts so that we can truly see Jesus and encounter him for ourselves in his risen power. Glory to you, Jesus. Amen. I love this story in John 20, maybe because it's such a personal, private encounter. It's just Jesus and Mary, no one else. Or maybe it's because it's with a woman who, if this hadn't happened to her, would have been sidelined and forgotten from history. It's such a visual story. It draws us in and it plays in our mind's eye like a film. You can really picture it, can't you? It's a story about broken hearts and shattered dreams, of grief and sadness and searching, and of unexpected surprise and joy. And it's a beautiful story where the end meets the beginning and the beginning meets the end. It takes us right back to the beginning of John's Gospel and even further than that to the beginning of creation itself. 
because it begins with the darkness. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary goes to the tomb. There's a real sense of before in these opening verses, before what is to come, before what hasn't yet come to pass. She and we are still unknowing and there is darkness. Darkness and then light. In the beginning is how Genesis starts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. In the beginning is also how John's gospel starts. But now we see Jesus. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it. And now here in John chapter 20, we begin in the darkness where something is about to break through, but we haven't seen it yet. And it happens in a garden. Gardens are not part of normal life in the Middle East like they are for us. It's a hot, dry climate and rain is quite rare. So a garden signifies a very special place, a lush, well-tended place that has had love and care and attention lavished on it or it wouldn't survive. We find God present in a garden in Genesis, where the whole story begins. We find Jesus in a garden before he's arrested as he wrestles with his father and with his destiny. And now the tomb is in a garden. We know that because it's Joseph of Arimathea's tomb and he was a wealthy man. And in a minute, we're going to see that Mary thinks that she's talking to the gardener. All of this has beautiful significance. In the beginning was God who created the world and created humanity, which he loved. In the beginning was the word who was with God and was God and who came to give himself for humanity, who he loved. The light appears to have gone out, but a new dawn is coming. And here today is the next new beginning. It's the end, but it's also the beginning. One chapter has ended, but this is the beginning of a new chapter, which will never end. It's the first day of the rest of eternity, because everything is different now. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb early in the morning, while it's still dark. And she goes out of love. Some might say that the likes of her should be having nothing to do with God and the Saviour. But what no one can argue with is her love. She's probably still frightened, but she goes because her heart is broken. It's her love that drives her to overcome her fears and all the taboos. She just needs to go there, to where he is her Lord, her teacher, her friend. He may be dead and sealed in a tomb, but she needs to be there and be near him. But she finds that the stone has been moved, it's been rolled away. And she doesn't seem to stop to look inside at this point, she just runs to find some of the disciples. And they come and have a look. Peter and John, they come running, racing with each other, desperate to see what's happened. And they look inside and they see the empty wrappings from the body lying there. And then it says, big anticlimax here, then they went home. They've seen and they haven't seen. They've seen and not understood really what they've seen. And so they just go home. 
How often do we do that? We encounter something and we're baffled by it because we can't get past our human perspective. There's something miraculous there if only we had the eyes to see and understand. We really need to ask God to unblock our eyes so we can see what's there sometimes. So they go home, having decided there's nothing more to see, and by doing that, they completely miss the absolute greatest moment in history. That moment is for Mary alone. She's still there. She stays at the tomb crying. And let's notice that it's because her heart is broken that she stays and she lingers. Because the worst has happened and her grief has shattered her, that's why she's still there. She's got nowhere else to go if her Lord isn't there. Never think that your grief and your brokenness separate you from God. Because it's in those moments when there's nothing left that you can find him if you stay long enough. She may have lost all hope, but there's something that she hasn't let go of yet. At one point, she looks inside the tomb and there's a pair of angels in there. They definitely weren't there when the disciples went inside or they might have stuck around. Or was it just that they weren't able to see them? But Mary sees them. Why are you crying? they ask her. And her answer shows that she's still focused on what she thinks has happened. The only way she can make sense of any of it, of what she's seeing. Because they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've put him. The only thought that makes any sense to her is that Jesus's body has been stolen. And the violence and the horror and the trauma of the last three days would make it feel absolutely plausible that someone would do that. There certainly couldn't be any other explanation for why the body isn't there. She's expecting there to be a dead body and when it isn't there, she finds her own logical explanation for that. Resurrection doesn't even enter her mind, it's not even a possibility. Often we will determine where an end comes without ever entertaining the possibility that as well as an end it might be a beginning. We really need to ask God to unblock our eyes so we can see what he's doing which may be so far beyond our imaginings that we'll never see it without his help. The angels don't seem to have much to say so Mary turns away again only to find Jesus himself standing there. But her eyes can't see who it is. She thinks it must be the gardener. He asks her the same question and she gives him the same response, maybe hoping that he'll be a bit more help. If you've moved his body, she says, just tell me where he is and I'll go and get him. And now we're reaching the climax. We know who this is, but she doesn't yet. And we're on the edge of our seats waiting for her to realise. I suppose there are lots of things that he could have said to her. He could have said, it's me. Don't you recognise me? Look, I'm back. He could have said, well, of course, this is the fulfilment of everything that was foretold and given her a sermon to make sure that she got the full significance. But he doesn't do either of those things. Thank goodness. What he does say takes our breath away and it would have taken hers away too. He calls her by her name, Mary. And that's the connection that opens her eyes. He speaks her name. Her name is the thing that identifies her from every other person on the planet and he speaks it tenderly. Here in this garden, the risen Jesus speaks her own individual name and he speaks yours too. 
He loves each one of us as if we were the only one. Her grief and her pain and just the limitations of being human have blinded her to what's happening, but not anymore. It's in hearing her own name that suddenly she discovers the possibility of something new, something completely unexpected and unforeseen and unimaginable. It's in hearing her name that the light breaks into the darkness of her grief and pain and a possibility that she hadn't even thought of is now a reality. Her own name is spoken by God himself and he invites her into a new reality which is birthed out of the ashes of the old. She'd come expecting to find the dead body of something which had been alive but was now destroyed, but that's not what she finds. She came expecting to see what she's expecting to see, and when it's not there, she's baffled and confused. And when Jesus stands in front of her, she doesn't recognise him visually. But then she recognises his voice. Do we have times when we expect to encounter God in a certain way, in the way that we expect? And then when he communicates in a way we're not expecting, do we turn away and miss it? How open is your heart to things you might miss if you stick only to what you know and what you expect? How much do our expectations limit what we can experience and understand. Mary finally recognises the impossible, the unexpected, the unlooked for, the illogical and nonsensical. And in some ways it's her ability to do that, to suspend logic and common sense that enables her to have this unique role which is for her alone. She's able to take that leap from the sensible and predictable reality into the void of what makes no sense, of what isn't humanly possible, of what cannot be planned for or predicted or measured or controlled. She steps off that edge and Jesus meets her there. And now it's her turn to run. She runs to find the disciples and tell them what she's found. And by doing that, she now has a role unparalleled in history. She is an apostle to the apostles, a messenger to the messengers, a teacher to the teachers, a preacher to the preachers. I think it's deeply significant that Jesus gave that unparalleled role to a woman and not a respectable, eminent woman but a looked down on, judged to be a sinner woman. She has witnessed and experienced something that not even the disciples have witnessed and experienced. And now she's given the job of telling them, of being the first teller of the news that will reshape history. I have seen the Lord. I've seen him. The Greek word that John uses for see is horeo, which means to know, to understand and believe. And here for Mary, it means now my eyes can see a new and amazing reality. In Genesis, God drives Adam and Eve out of the garden because of their disobedience. Jesus leaves the Garden of Gethsemane under arrest on his way to his trial and death. But here Jesus sends Mary out of the garden singing, dancing. She arrived in darkness, little knowing what awaited her. And now the dawn has come and she's got the task of telling everyone this earth shattering news that the darkness has not overcome the light that the light 
who is the light of all people, the light of life, has defeated the darkness and the darkness can never win. In this garden, there is a new beginning, a new world, a new life, a new creation, a new reality which will never pass away. Jesus' new reality, new hope, new future has dawned. This is the message of Easter. That every one of us who has been without hope, without light, without true meaning in life, can have new life, new hope, new meaning. We can live in expectant hope, in confidence, in freedom from sin and darkness, from the ashes of what was before arises this resurrection hope which transforms us from the inside until it overflows into transformed lives. In a moment when this video finishes I want you to go to the song See What a Morning which is in our playlist. It's also called the Resurrection Hymn. It's my absolute favourite Easter hymn and each verse finishes with the line, for he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. And we can sing that with joy today. I'll certainly be belting it out. We may never have another Easter day quite like this one. And there may be dark times ahead. We may find ourselves in the darkness of the garden before the dawn. But the dawn will break and the risen Christ will vanquish the darkness forever and our hope and our transformation cannot be shaken. For he lives, Christ is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. Amen.